Welcome to Cloud Security Podcast. Today we are talking about, I want to say AI and cyber security, but I got Amol. Hey man, thanks Hi. for coming on the show. Hi there. Uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself and where do you work and what are you doing in cyber security, man? So I've been in cyber security for a little over 20 years. Started as a member of a red team doing hacking into everything from applications to physical buildings and then switched over to building cybersecurity products in application security and widely enterprise and cloud security. At the moment, I work at Palo Alto Networks where I run the Prisma Cloud, which is Palo Alto's cloud security speedboat. How is the threat landscape from where it used to be to where in 2024, where are we? Typically, and this is just not for cloud, but threat landscape follows where all the the important stuff is. Yeah. Because whether you're hacking for notoriety or whether you're hacking for financial gain, you go after places where there is mission critical workloads, mission critical applications, sensitive data that you can sell on the dark web and so on. So over the last sort of five years, cloud really started going mainstream. And the COVID pandemic like hyper accelerated that journey where customers are building, migrating their tier one revenue generating regulated applications in the cloud Regulators are becoming more comfortable with it. So as a result, the threat actors are squarely going after cloud infrastructure and cloud applications. Yeah. So we have seen a big surge in the frequency and sophistication of attacks against the cloud uh, environment. Now the attack might start with someone getting social engineered on their enterprise laptop, but then eventually they pivot off and move into the cloud because that's where the crown jewels are. A lot of people were talking about the whole code to cloud movement for some time right. where IAC kind of became that default. Yeah. And now I feel I'm making a prediction here, but like it feels like it's going from code to cloud to SOC based on what I'm hearing from most people. And yeah. I don't know, where you, where do you stand on that whole thing? We have the most comprehensive code to cloud platform, which we launched uh, about 18 months back. But we fundamentally believe that for an enterprise, and we hear this from customers all the time, protecting an enterprise is now equally becoming as protecting the cloud. Because yeah. you know, organizations are largely in the public cloud spectrum when they talk about their critical uh, applications. So enterprise socks, a few years back, the cloud used to be on the fringe. Enterprise socks didn't really understand cloud constructs, cloud technology. So when they had to do any kind of incident response or incident triage, they would either pull someone in who understood the cloud or try to log into different cloud tools to understand, hey, what exactly is going on? So what we realize is that to, to truly get a handle on threat detection, incident response, incident management, bring that mean time uh, down to some minutes, you need to natively understand cloud constructs and cloud technologies. For example, uh, there is an incident against a cloud workload. That alert shows up in uh, your security operations platform. There are some containers, some identities involved. If you want to truly understand in a very rapid way, for example, when was this identity created? What does this identity have access to? What is this workload? What is, what is the criticality of it? What is running on that workload? Rather than calling someone who understands cloud or logging into another solution, imagine if you natively had all the context available. Yeah. And go a step further and say, you don't even have to ask for the context because AI and guided investigations is already telling you what the relevant context should be that you should be asking for. That's the journey that we are envisioning so that from a threat detection and incident response and secure operation standpoint, it's all natively integrated. One of the conversations that I've been having with a lot of people about this code to cloud to SOC transition has been the fact that most organizations have had SOC for years. Yeah. They are well equipped in the whole, hey, I know on-premise really well. I know applications really well. I know attack paths really well there as well. But there's generally a lack of cloud knowledge gap as well in that SOC layer. And I think that's like in most of the conversation we have with CISOs, okay, that's like, like how am I going to take this workforce and make them cloud friendly for lack of a better word so they yeah. understand the cloud attack context as well. Do you see that change as well? Or what are you seeing people Absolutely. doing in that space? I mean, today it's the cloud. Now we see AI coming in. Tomorrow it will be some other technology. Yeah. Now, SOC operators, whether it's tier one or tier two operators, they can't become experts in every new piece of technology that comes out. Yeah. So what we fundamentally believe is they are smart people working in the SOC, but the tools need to be intelligent enough to give the SOC operators all the necessary needed context yeah. at their fingertips. And with AI, they need to even know what context even before the operator is asking you yeah. so that the operator can effectively do their job at scale. It's less about teaching the operator about every single piece of technology that's in the enterprise because that's not feasible or possible. Yeah. But how can the right tools give you the context at your fingertips, basically? Interesting. Would you say in the context of AI, because you've been talking about AI so much, I'm curious, how do you see the AI sort of evolve in this cybersecurity world? 
obviously we're at an event here sure. and we've heard a few announcements, but I'm curious from your perspective, now that I've understood, okay, there is a knowledge gap in the SOC here, yep. and sounds like AI could be the potential answer here yep. as well. Where do, you, where do you see AI play a role in cybersecurity moving forward? We look at AI from two lenses. There's precision AI, and then there's generative AI. Precision AI has been around for many years. This is your machine learning models, your statistical models, supervised, unsupervised. And then generative AI, everyone knows, is the new thing that's been around for just the last year and a half. Now, the application of these two AI constructs, we look at it from three lenses. Yep. Number one is securing with AI, which means how can you do far superior threat detection so that incidents can be caught and responded to much quicker. Number two is securing the AI. So now you've got a bunch of applications using generative AI components, how do you get visibility around it? How do you understand the posture of it? And then finally have runtime detection of all the evolving AI attacks. And the third one is how do you simplify cybersecurity by using AI? That's where generative AI is playing a really key role. Yeah. So whether it's guided investigations, whether it's being a, a assistive uh, remediation, uh, whether it's summarization, the ability to connect data sets uh, and, and create complex queries by an operator simply asking a question in English or multiple languages. Those are the areas where we see uh, AI playing a significant role in, in getting amazing outcomes for our customers. Interesting. And do you almost feel like the hesitation a lot of people have is we have a lot of what do you call uh, hallucination challenges that people have been talking sure. about. And people, when they hear about Gen AI, they're like, I'm like how are we going to make sure that my SOC analytics is not working on something which is going to send them to the wrong side rabbit hole because they have to deal with network security, cloud security. Yeah. They have their own sort challenges as well. How do you see this play out in that kind of world? In those, because there's a lot more than just cloud security today. Sure. In Gen AI, it's hallucination. In precision AI, there's always false positives and, and false negative problem. So yes, as an organization that has deep expertise and a big research team, we are constantly focused in measuring the efficacy of our solutions, which means that we have people looking at the output coming out of whatever, uh, whether it's, it's Gen AI or Precision AI, to see whether this is actually right or wrong. And we are building guardrails in place, yeah. especially when it comes to uh, Gen AI. And that's where we get the confidence uh, before we release products out that, hey, is this within that high 90s of accuracy uh, where this can drive uh, effective outcomes for our customers? One thing that was interesting for me, specifically in that conversation around how AI can empower network security, SOC, as well as cloud security, was around the security leaders who are listening to this conversation, watching this. They're obviously hearing a lot of AI from a lot of people. Where do you see this, I think, differentiation for them to help make that call for what AI is the right one for cybersecurity for them? Even before Gen AI, like AI, ML, in threat detection has been around for a while, and you're right. As a buyer of these products is very hard because everybody's using the same terminology in terms of having these buzzwords in their security detection stack. Now, obviously, the most ideal way would be that you're super sophisticated and you do proof of concepts of all these technologies, run them through the ringer of extremely sophisticated threats and so on. But the average organization is very hard for them to do that. Right? Yeah. In absence of that, you need to really look at some basic uh, fundamental principles of the philosophy behind using AI mm. uh, by different vendors. So number one, to really have effective AI, which has high efficacy, you need to have a lot of data yeah. to train that AI model, right? Yeah. Good data, yeah. bad data that is labeled properly. Fundamentally understanding how does an organization have data at scale so that the the, the efficacy of the model is only as good as the, the underlying data, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you, let's say vendor A or product A, it has 500 customers, right? Mid-size, some enterprise, versus another company that has 60,000 customers and a wide range of very large enterprises to mid-market. That gives you a sense of, okay, what data do you have access to to yep. build your AI models? And then you have to really ask the right questions around the maturity of the security research team that is informing the data science and analytics team on what are the threats that are out there that they need to build machine learning models around. So those are the things that I would ask serious questions around if I was a buyer of AI-based detection technology yeah, to yeah. Sort of really pass through the noise and understand who's sci-fi versus who's real AI. It's a good way because I think the data is what makes the difference where yeah. some of the newer players in the market may not have a lot of data to work through. They don't. But for people who have been working in this space for a long time, have a lot of threat intelligence data, they definitely can do a lot more in terms of not just 
they have a data set to work with that can help build the accuracy instead of just someone claiming that can have accuracy. No, and, and even for people who have data, we have gone through this pain. It is not something you can perfect overnight. You can write a regular expression rule. It is quite deterministic. You can tune it in a couple of days. But when you talk about AI, it takes time. It yeah, takes a lot yeah. of data, a lot of customer feedback to really understand if you have perfected a technology or not. So it's not something that you can very easily crack. No, nah, agreed. Awesome. Now, thank you so much for sharing that. Where can people find more about all the stuff that you guys are doing and the products you're building to make AI and cybersecurity a bit more accessible for people? Yeah, obviously go to paloantronetworks.com across NetSec, cloud security and our uh, security operations platform. There'll be links to sign up for the early test drive of our AI products. Nice. And of course, get information on all the new stuff that we are doing there. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you so much for coming on the show as well. Thank you. Thank you for listening or watching this episode of Cloud Security Podcast. We have been running for the past five years, so I'm sure we haven't covered everything cloud security yet. And if there's a particular cloud security topic that we can cover for you in an interview format on Cloud Security Podcast or make a training video on to tutorials on Cloud Security Bootcamp, definitely reach out to us on info at cloudsecuritypodcast.gv. By the way, if you're interested in AI and cybersecurity, as many cybersecurity leaders are, you might be interested in our system AI cybersecurity podcast, which I run with former CSO of Robinhood, Caleb Seema, where we talk about everything AI and cybersecurity. How can organizations deal with cybersecurity on AI systems, AI platforms, whatever AI has to bring next as an evolution of chat, GPT, and everything else continues. If you have any other suggestions, definitely drop them on info at cloudsecuritypodcast.tv. I'll drop that in the description and the show notes as well, so you can reach out to us easily. Otherwise, I will see you in the next episode. Peace.